Okay, we'll go to the last uh, speaker, which is uh, Dr. Larry Shinis from NYU, that is going to talk about sleep apnea and AFib metanalysis. Good morning. On Friday morning of HRS, I feel particularly qualified to talk about the effects of sleep deprivation. <laughs> The cognitive approach is really most profound, so I apologize during this uh, presentation. So I, there has been a fair amount of discussion, and I would like to avoid much repetition. So I'm going to try to concentrate on the results of our study that was recently published, uh, which I believe uh, is the most definitive study published to date on the effects of treatment of sleep apnea uh, on atrial fibrillation. So. Purely as it relates to atrial fibrillation, we have antirhythmic drugs, we have catheter ablation, but our ability to maintain sinus rhythm in the broad spectrum of patients has been somewhat limited. Uh, and what we have underestimated and we need to concentrate on are the comorbidities that exist in our patients with atrial fibrillation. And if we do not address them directly, then all of our efforts will be uh, very much limited over time. Age, hypertension, obesity, diabetes mellitus, uh, progressive structural changes, aggressive treatment of any of these reversible, potentially reversible factors uh, will be very substantial in reducing the goal um, in the burden of atrial fibrillation. We now must consider sleep apnea as a uh, direct comorbidity for heart disease. Just as we look at diabetes and blood pressure, smoking, cholesterol, as Randy had spoken to you about, sleep disorders has an equal impact on this cardiovascular morbidity. Uh, and DJ showed this slide to show that those uh, associations between sleep apnea and many comorbidities is profound, but as it relates to atrial fibrillation, it is our belief that 50% of patients with atrial fibrillation do in fact have uh, sleep apnea. It is a known risk factor, uh, and patients with obstructive sleep apnea have clear evidence, and this has been shown, so I'm going to go really quickly, of the structural remodeling as it relates to the development of fibrosis, electrophysiologic changes that promote atrial fibrillation. Uh, there have been meta-analyses already that have shown that you do poorly if you don't treat sleep apnea. Uh, this is a, a study that Andrea published showing the effects of comorbidities and the metabolic syndrome on the effects of treatment of catheter ablation and atrial fibrillation, and you can see very clearly that obstructive sleep apnea is a direct additive effect on other uh, comorbidities in the uh, development of atrial fibrillation. Um, these were the remodeling trials, so I'm going to go right past them uh, and talk directly about our study. So we engaged a meta-analysis to look at the direct effects of the use of CPAP on the treatment of atrial fibrillation. Um, there have been lots of small studies, and the small studies up to date have had somewhat variable results. And the extent of the net clinical benefit from the use of CPAP in patients of obstructive sleep apnea have been somewhat inconclusive. It was very difficult to say, uh, although we had the physiology behind what we uh, understood about the effects of sleep disordered breathing, we did really not have the data. So the results of our meta-analysis, we believe, prevent, present the highest strength of evidence that's currently available for the association between CPAP uh, and reduced AF recurrence, whether treated medically or with catheter ablation. Um, so this was a meta-analysis that was done very meticulously under the guidelines of the PRISMA statement. Uh, we did a very extensive literature search. We looked for the key terms of atrial fibrillation, obstructive sleep apnea, CPAP, pulmonary vein isolation, and directly at arrhythmia recurrence. Uh, we only included um, randomized trials. We only included trials that looked directly at the effects of CPAP. Um, the outcome was reported clinically in terms of arrhythmia recurrence, and the study duration had to be at least six months. Um, so it was really quite meticulous, and we excluded anything that did not really meet these criteria. Our primary endpoints of our meta-analysis was the recurrence of atrial fibrillation in CPAP users and non-users in patients uh, with obstructive sleep apnea. And as I said before, we looked at patients both who were treated with catheter ablation as well as those patients who were treated medically. To do a meta-analysis carefully and uh, to really have truly robust results, you need to look very carefully at the presence of heterogeneity or publication bias. So all of our results were recalculated by eliminating each study one by one and recalculating the data to ensure uh, that this data was in fact true and quite robust. The statistical analysis, I hope you don't ask me too much about, but um, it did achieve this uh, 
quite meticulously. Then when we finished that, we did a meta-regression analysis to evaluate the relationship of covariates of atrial fibrillation on this treatment of sleep apnea. So we looked at study duration, body mass, hypertension, coronary disease, age, gender, diabetes, we looked at each of these covariates to make sure that they were not unduly influencing our results. So in the end, after screening 362 potentially relevant studies uh, through all of our exclusion criteria, we ended up with six studies that were robust enough to be included in this meta-analysis. Uh, they were all published uh, in very substantial journals. And you can see through this list that there were variable amount numbers of patients ranging from 315 down to 12. Uh, but if you look briefly at the results, which I'll present again, the recurrence rates for CPAP users uh, was substantially lower uh, than those patients who were non-users or non-compliant. The relative risk reduction uh, was about 42%. So in terms of our primary endpoint and the effective use of CPAP on AF recurrence, CPAP users and patients with obstructive sleep apnea was associated with a reduced relative risk of atrial fibrillation in comparison to non-users with a 42% relative risk reduction and a very highly statistically significant data. Um, this is the combined uh, analysis showing the very clear favoring of, of uh, CPAP. Uh, this is called a funnel plot, and uh, this, again, is one of those statistical tools that we use to make sure that despite the variations in the number of patients in each study and the different uh, methods that can be used, that there was no individual publication bias. Uh, with this, what we described as a very perfect funnel plot, um, it, again, it substantiates the robust uh, outcome of our data. When we then looked at a sensitivity analysis, specifically looking at patients who were treated with catheter ablation or who were treated uh, with uh, medical therapy alone, the results were exactly the same. They both came out to a 42% relative risk reduction, whether you were treated with catheter ablation or treated with medical therapy. So the impact of this is that 50% of our patients would do better if they, in fact, had their sleep apnea effectively treated with CPAP, uh, whether we treated their atrial fibrillation medically or with catheter ablation. Um, really quite profound, and here it is again, looking at each of the studies individually. And then, finally, the univariate meta-regression uh, analysis, looking at all of those multiple factors, uh, there was not a single statistically significant factor that influenced our results. So age, diabetes, hypertension, left atrial dimension, left ventricular ejection fraction, none of them had a substantial effect upon our outcome. So our conclusions were that there was a 42% relative risk reduction of recurrent atrial fibrillation among patients with obstructive sleep, uh, sleep apnea who, in fact, do use CPAP. There was no significant heterogeneity. There was no significant publication bias. And there was a consistent effect of CPAP use across all patients, irrespective of whether they, in fact, underwent catheter ablation or not. And as I said, our univariate uh, meta-regression analysis showed no influence of study duration or patient factors on outcomes. So I think this is really profound data. I think it is the best we have. And as you listen to all of the talks that preceded me today, it's pretty clear. It's unequivocally clear that we are not effectively treating our patients with atrial fibrillation unless we screen them for sleep apnea. The use of CPAP needs to be emphasized and strongly advocated in these patients, irrespective of your course of treatment. Uh, and the question really is, is do we in fact begin our therapy without first referring them to sleep app? You've seen the effects of the watch pad here. People have spoken about it. It's now really quite easy. The mechanism is very smooth in an integrated uh, laboratory or outpatient clinic. Uh, so there's really no excuses for us to not effectively treat our patients. Additional lifestyle modification has a significant impact on recurrence. There were three papers that I saw over the last couple days related to obesity and some other areas as it relates to atrial fibrillation. And there are also two studies that were published suggesting the potential of non-pulmonary vein triggers in patients with sleep apnea, uh, again, suggesting that our standard approach to treatment for catheter ablation of atrial fibrillation uh, is not a one-size-fits-all. We really need to understand the patient population. Um, Itamar has helped us, as DJ told you, with our smooth integration in our laboratory. So it all comes in our office. The patients are sent home with a monitoring device. One of our nurses initiates it. We have doctors who uh, are able to help and fill in. Uh, it takes zero effort from the clinician. 
I, I got to repeat that. It takes zero effort from cl clinician. Last time I presented this data, I was asked by a very prominent electrophysiologist who said to me, so Larry, now you're getting into the sleep business? And I said, my friend, no, I'm in the atrial fibrillation business, but I have an organization that can help treat our patients with sleep apnea. So the effort from my part is extraordinarily small. The other area that you should remember about is compliance. So there are now organizations and people who will help our patients maintain compliance. It is, again, not up to me to make the phone call five times are you using your mask, uh, but Philips and some others have coaching guides and, and ways to help people comply with a very difficult form of therapy, and that is something that we clearly need to work on, but it, it does not impact the electrophysiologist. We have to treat our patients with atrial fibrillation, and we cannot be so uh, tunnel-minded to think that we could do it with a catheter or with a drug alone. We do need to treat the patient as a whole. So the current therapy is problematic, uh, and I'm hoping that our colleagues will continue to work on, uh, but we do hope that this situation does, in fact, exist sometimes to uh, help our patients. So it was a little quick, but I did want to give you what I think is the most up-to-date uh, data out there, uh, and combined with everything that my colleagues spoke about today, I think the message is really quite profound. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Larry. Uh, I think that the, in summary, um, as Larry said very well, we, we need to treat the patient beyond what is our subspecialty. So uh, sleep apnea is an important and critical part of a successful management, and uh, uh, we need better tool to achieve that goal, and uh, uh, we have one, is one of the pieces. Uh, um, and uh, I think I, I agree, you know, we talk about uh, team approach, but the reality is that at least to uh, engage the patient uh, it requires very little effort, as, as Larry said. So that's a, you know, an important critical step in, uh, in this process. I don't know if anybody has any comment. Uh, yes? I'm just curious because compliance is such a huge issue. We talk about the cumbersome nature of the sleep machines, automat, whatever. Are there advances? Are there any sleep doctors here? No. Well, the if there is any advancement in, in you know, compliance, uh, you know, we, uh, we all talk about compliance. That, you know, obviously... Any less clumpier? Yes. On, on more patient-friendly sense. I don't think we So, the, yeah, they are... So, the, no, they are, they, there is no major... Yes, but they are mouth devices that are not uh, as uh, big as... Uh, that can at least treat some of these patients. So. There are they are a fewer uh, a, some additional option, but no major breakthrough. So that's a big problem because, uh, as you uh, mentioned, the compliance uh, with the mask it's a big issue. Uh, and, I, and part of that we need to reinforce to our patient that we we cannot do that very well. Both with the sleep apnea, the people that are overweight, that they need to do their part. I mean, if they want to treat success or help us to treat successfully their problem, uh, in, you know, for, for us as AFib, they need to sort of do their part and, and in food is the papier is to try to it's, it's, uh, I'll live tell you to a it. funny story about one of my patient's spouse. So she tells me, well, doc, thanks for forcing my husband to really get tested and wear the CPAP machine. Up until this point in time, we used to sleep in two separate rooms but now we're able to sleep in the same bed. I don't mind the hissing sound of the CPAP machine than this loud snoring that he would make me stay awake all night long. So probably the hissing sound of the CPAP machine is more soothing and probably puts her to bed faster than him. <laughs> that's, that's kind of one of those funny things I thought I'll share. I'm just uh, gonna say that we have found that there is somewhat of an educational process. Some of the earlier data suggested more ro uh, robust results with polysomnography and overnight sleep studies. But they're old, and you know, depending upon the willingness of sleep uh, specialists to embrace new techniques and new technology, like all of us, uh, so we do need to engage them. And through an educational process, uh, the increased compliance is so profound compared to the potentially mild changes in the results uh, that everybody complies really quickly. So it's really about compliance, spreading the technology to a larger group of patients. The small differences I really feel are not that consequential. Yeah, the same for us. I think you, 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 you find acceptance. And the problem that DJ mentioned is 
probably more relevant when you have rapid uh, variation of rate. So if you're patient, uh, probably rate control, you see less issue with that. But the, I, don't, I, I haven't seen any sort of any major obstruction. Uh, at the end, you, you engage them. Uh, so they, it, it takes a little bit of education at the beginning, but then after it's actually. I think even for the sleep directors, like uh, the NOx2 unit is a lot more expensive than this. And there are a lot more moving parts to it that the patient is not too comfortable managing it at home. Whereas this is a single unit, you just put it on and people go to bed. Yes, if you really you know, dissect it to the minutest detail, side by side comparison, maybe there are one or two things that you can have in addition in the NOx2 reporting process than this. But in the end, I think the basic parameters that you would require to appropriately manage a patient uh, is all there. So, the, you know, the reality of things is kind of funny because the day that we had used to refer the patient for a standard sleep study, we had to talk to the patient, then they had to get an appointment, and we realized that many of them, they never did it. Now, when they come to our office, they see this little flyer <coughs> about, uh, they ask to do it, because they, it's so easy. So they, there is, you know, clearly a benefit from the easy of the device uh, in uh, sort of reaching uh, the diagnosis. I think that's really, is, is striking me. I never, I had to, in the past, I used to have to talk to the patient, and convince them to go and do a sleep study. Now they ask me, so I saw that flyer, do you think I should do it? I said, yes. So it's, it's really uh, more convenient, no doubt. And, and with no offense to any other doctors in the room, I think when the word comes from the mouth of the cardiologist, the impact it creates in the head is a lot more profound. On doctor's orders, especially your cardiologist's orders, uh, it goes a much longer way. And I think I've played this trick repeatedly, time and time again, to ensure better compliance on the patients. Larry, what do you say? Okay. okay, very good. Thank you very much for uh, giving us a very